Welcome to the session. Um, Sam was talking about how she doesn't really like too much of using templates, but I want to show that. <laughs> so it's kind of, I should have probably packed up my presentation or changed it, but I just de decided to stick to my guns and actually show that templates can be a good thing um, when we are not um, kind of thinking in a very particular strand, but kind of using them more on a broader range. Um, because oftentimes when we start implementing ePortfolios at an organization or at our own universities or schools, we think like, yay, let's go with it. Everyone will be excited about suddenly using ePortfolios because they are so nice, they are getting away from assessment and exams and all that jazz, but you can have some really great work going on and you can be extremely creative. But unfortunately, that's often not the reality. Oftentimes you're like, students, oh my gosh, I have something else to do and does it count towards my grade? Do I get any credit points for it? How much time do I need to spend on it? Do I now not have any weekend at all? And the lecturer is very similarly, oh no, not yet another tool that I have to learn, not yet another requirement that we have to fulfill and kind of get on with. And that's the reality we have to deal with. We are excited about e-portfolios, experiential learning, personal learning environments and all that, whereas the people that are supposed to use them are more hesitant and may not really be too interested in kind of jumping right in and doing things because the e-portfolio is still oftentimes a mystery for people. They've heard it and they've only heard negative things about it because somebody else just spent 10 hours creating their e-portfolio and had to turn it in the next day. Well, if you did your e-portfolio throughout the term time, it actually wouldn't really be that much more work. Um, it's just a matter of time management, organization, and how it's also approached. And so kind of finding a good way of not frightening lecturers and students creating e-portfolios, but also not dumbing them down and kind of making them checklist things. That's an important thing. And that's why I still choose to talk about templates because interestingly, and that's, uh, that is actually a difference between New Zealand and Australia and the Northern Hemisphere. In New Zealand and Australia, temp or at least in New Zealand, templates are really, really in and people love using them because um, the e-portfolio or Mahara is being used more for assessment and evaluation purposes. Whereas in the Northern Hemisphere and Germany and so on, they all said, oh my gosh, please stay away from templates. We are not using them. They are kind of too restrictive for us. We want to be more on the personal learning environment side and give people the freedom. And so what we try to do is kind of incorporate both views and allow for both of them. And so let's see what you can do when you use a template for getting started using ePortfolios in a class or even with teachers and instructors when they create their own. Because oftentimes they simply don't know what an ePortfolio is, are frightened because they don't know what it is. And so what we have to do, like with anything that we newly introduce in the classroom, we have to scaffold, we have to give some sort of support. And one way could be using templates. But what I'd really like to say is, it's not a stamp. So it's not something that you just fill in and tick boxes or where you only have a little um, field available where you can put stuff in. It is not a stamp. And it is also not paint by numbers. So you don't really have an outline and then on one field you're supposed to color green and another field you're supposed to color everything yellow and then yet in another brown so that yes, the end result is very beautiful, but every end result looks the same. We want to have individualization. And that's why I think the templates that I'm thinking of are more of an invitation. They are not a form and a restrictive framework, but they are an invitation to get started with and to grow and use it as spaces and expand on. Like in half finished house, because right now this house still has all the possibilities. I can paint it yellow, I can paint it brown, I can paint it blue, I cannot paint it at all, I can leave it all natural. Um, I can put a roof on it, which might be good in certain climates and others who might not really need it that often. I can make a retractable roof. I have so many choices, but I'm still building a house. And so what I think is important to do with when we introduce ePortfolios is to say, yes, you are building an ePortfolio and there are certain, uh, there's a certain framework and certain requirements that you need to fulfill. But how you do it, that is up to you. 
whether you put a video file in, whether you put an audio file in, an image, whether you work with text, that is up to you. You can build it and you can even change it around because while the door is still here, I can still put a window in if I like that better and if I have the money or the skill to do so. And same thing with the ePortfolio. It can be creative and it can still be personalized so that we still get that personal control over the portfolio that a few people were talking about in the keynote. And so what I'd like to show you now are uh, a number of templates which are quite different in, in a number of ways to show you the, the breadth of what is possible and how those templates support the learners and also the in, instructors in their ePortfolio work, but then also how they can be taken further. So this first one, and you're not really supposed to read much, it's just to give you an outline there. Um, this one is from Namanakura Oa Popo, uh, the uh, Māori Nursing and Midwifery Program, which is also going to um, having the, the platform nurse portfolio. And a number of um, DHBs have already started using those templates because the registered nurse portfolio is very restrictive. You have a lot of competencies that you need to show and you need to show them in whichever way. So what they did is create a template consisting of multiple pages and each competency has one page available so that it can be talked about that. And on the left hand side you always have the competency description and that also helps for, for consistency so the nurses who are really really busy every single day don't have much time but still need to keep in portfolio um, they know on the left is my competency uh, description in the middle I put my own self-assessment information in so my own reflections all the things that um, are important to me in showing that I'm competent in that area and then on the right hand side they can go creative because there they have space for putting files and other supporting evidence Evidence. And it is not said how they are supposed to do that. So whether they upload a file or write some more text or scan in a, uh, scan in a certificate is entirely up to the nurses. And tomorrow we'll actually be hearing more about that because Suzanne Johnson from Canterbury DHB is going to talk about her experience at CDHB in using those templates. And before that, Tama Kempe from Namanukoda is going to talk about the um, e-portfolio site for the nurses in general and what the aim was behind it. And so here we have a very simple looking template, but it has a lot of potential because it just gives a very bare framework and then nurses can add more or less depending on how much time they have and also how, uh, how capable they are and feel comfortable putting online. This is a template from uh, Tiri Tomaioa, um, Early Childhood New Zealand, and we do have uh, Sue Smorty and Gwen David from the organization here. So if you have any questions for their templates, please feel free to ask them questions over the next couple of days, how they have also been working with it, um, what their experiences are. This one, uh, or Easy and said started using portfolios in the postgrad uh, last year and also in the TER, the Teacher Education Refresh Program. And this year, actually, all bachelor students are introduced to the ePortfolio. And so they've set up a number of templates to help the students get started and also get some consistency in, but still allowing for creativity. And here we have a um, standard looking template where we have instructions directly on the page, but they are hidden so that they don't close up the entire page because once you've read the instructions once or twice you kind of pretty much know what you um, what you're supposed to do so they can fade away and take a step back and that's why those instructions are just used in the retractable <coughs> block um, then there are also individual task descriptions or activity descriptions again to tease out what uh, the students are supposed to reflect on and um, it's not really easily to see on this projector but they have a different background so that you can distinguish them more easily from the general text that the students then write. So that again it's through visualization kind of indicated what are instructions and where's, where does actually my uh, text start. And then the students can fill in uh, their comments but they could also add images or other supporting evidence. 
Here we have a template from Marlboro Girls College um, set up by Julian um, Adamson. And this is a very typical template of, uh, in New Zealand schools for the registered teacher criteria. So if you are on myportfolio.school.nz and you just search for registered teacher criteria, you'll find lots of different templates. And it's really nice to see uh, the diversity of them. Because here, the school decided to put a rationale in there on the left-hand side, explaining why they are using it and the, what the purpose and then they have general instructions which go across all RTC um, so that they don't have to repeat them on every single page. And of course, because it's an online um, environment, you can also link to outside resources to bring those in more and make them easily accessible. When we take a look at one actual RTC page, here you see that the school decided to show three criteria directly on it. And then when there are elements where the students are, where the teachers need to fill in something, they marked it with red here. Now write your goal in here so that they know uh, which, what are placeholders. And then for the possible evidence, what um, the teachers could put into their portfolio, they give suggestions. So again, it is not prescribed. There is no files to download block on there, or there's no external media block, or no, now you need to upload a video. It is left up to the teachers themselves to decide what they want to put in there. And of course, because Mahara doesn't lock down the templates, they are still free to change the layout. So if somebody doesn't like the three column layout, they can change it to two columns. And one last example from Tikhov High School. Um, they also started on registered teacher criteria, so exactly the same requirement as Marlboro Girls College, just on the primary level. Um, but Tikhov High took, um, I think, even a step further in the sense that they had a long uh, thought process around it, how they wanted to deal with their portfolio and what they wanted their teachers to get out of it. It took about a year to come up with those templates, and that might sound like a really, really long time. However, it was not so much setting up the templates, but more the thinking behind it. The entire e-portfolio process itself was new to the school, so they needed to acquaint the teachers with it first. They needed to establish the culture of reflection and working with the RTC, and they didn't just use the RTC and put them on there, but they brought it into the school context. So again, we have the rationale, um, and then in this case, the school also works quite a bit with images. So these images are transferred directly into the portfolios. And looking at one um, RTC itself, we have the key indicators, but then also reflective questions. So similarly to what ECNZ had done just separately, here it is merged into the re uh, registered teacher criteria pages. And so Tecofa School made it really their own, and they built another entire support process around so that they can really support their teachers in knowing what can you actually put into your portfolio. So now that you have your uh, templates, what could they actually look like? Here we have two examples from Solent University, uh, from students. Um, again, it is, uh, in this case, it is for employability purposes, but these two look very different. So the students bring in their own personality with their own images, um, change the background, and so even though you have the same task, the portfolio can look different. And that's why I think it is more of an invitation rather than a stamp um, that you're creating with a template and it can still be very creative. So if you want to share your templates now, there are multiple ways of doing it. If you create a template in your own account, you can just make it copyable to anybody who should have the um, who should be using the template and then people can copy it or you if you only want to um, give it to a subset of people you can also create a group page and then make that copyable but a better approach especially when you want to roll out the template across an entire organization or even kind of one-third or two-thirds of an organization set up the template as an institution page or institution collection so that when somebody registers new on the site they get that template automatically. And that's what we've done with um, early childhood because there, um, in one program, eight collections needed to be shared with students. So before the students registered, we just set up the templates automatically copyable into new accounts and as soon as the accounts were created, they had all the collections. And therefore, again, a hurdle was taken away from having to copy the pages first and making sure that everyone has them and so on. Um, 
What we'd also really like to do in the future more is that you also share your templates with the community. So don't just hawk them for yourself, keep them on your own instance, but show what you're doing with them, what you create. And as we see with the registered teacher criteria, lots of people do them, and so they can draw quite good um, inspiration from what you have been doing. And so if you want to share your templates, you can download your pages and collections as Leap2A file, and then upload them to our wiki and share them around. And if you let me know, we'll even put an announcement in the next newsletter or tweet it out so that more people know about it. And that was pretty much my quick introduction to kind of templates, why they could be useful and why we might want to work with them. And now we still have a few minutes for questions. Steven. Um, that automatic copying of pages and templates, Christina, how does yeah. that work? Is that something that an institution admin can set up? No, that's um, directly built into Mahara. And um, if I go into a Mahara instance, oh, actually, um, so do you, is it okay if I show your templates? So let's go into my portfolio.school, a life environment. And um, all you need to do really is Instead of setting up the, the pages under your user account or under a dummy user account, you would set them up under institutions as an institution page or collection. So if we take a look at the early childhood ones, there you see there's a whole lot of um, templates here. So graduating teacher standards, registered teacher criteria, teaching dispositions, teaching reflections, and then um, several um, collections for the teacher education refresh. And so, of course, not everybody is supposed to get those templates. So what has been done at the beginning when all the, at the beginning of the academic year when all the bachelor students registered, um, only the collections applicable to the bachelor students were um, made copyable with the automatic um, copying. And so if regular process of going into the edit access, but then instead of only going down to advanced options and choosing allow copying, what we've also done is click copy for new institution members. And then whenever a new user account is set up, they get those templates automatically. And that really is good when you have 300 students. And we all know students don't necessarily read instructions or one student is missing a class and therefore doesn't get to know what was talked about in class, doesn't find where the copying of a page is because um, admittedly it is a bit hidden and it does take a few steps to get there. In 1504 that is being changed, but still if we can avoid two, three or five clicks for the students and setting everything up beforehand and then just rolling it out to everyone just makes life a bit easier and also a bit less stressful on you as instructors and also on the learning technology support uh, staff. And so that's an easy way. And then um, <laughs> If you can focus on the really important things then. <laughs> and so once you have all your students registered or the majority registered and you want to um, roll out templates for all your staff, all new staff, then you take off the copying here and take the copy, uh, automatic copying on for those collections. Then you register all those staff members. They get the collections relevant to them and then you just put it back to uh, the regular people. <coughs> David. That, that's, a, <clears throat> that's a very cool technique for the creation of pages. Um, th there are other ways of, of getting really interesting display information in Mahara through journals. And I'm just wondering, is it possible that some future edition of Mahara that we would have multiple journals enabled and that you could actually have a couple of template journals in exactly the same way that you've got template collections. Mm -hmm. 
Number one, multiple journals enabling is currently possible on an individual basis, but what will be in 1504, so in the version that we are hopefully releasing next week, is that a site administrator can say everybody should have multiple journals enabled by default. We took that off a few years ago. It used to be the default, but people got really confused about what is a journal and um, what is a journal entry. So instead of creating journal entries, they were creating separate journals. And be because of the learning curve at that time, kind of blocks were not yet so great in education, and therefore we reversed that. But now we have this new feature in there, which will allow people to, or a site administrator to decide that quite easily. Um, what would, what's definitely on our wish list is already that you can create a journal in a group or also on a site uh, institution page. Because right now you can only create a journal in your own user account and you can make that copyable. So it can then go into the account of the students, but you wouldn't be able to do the automatic um, copying of pages into user accounts. So that's definitely something that is on our radar but hasn't been implemented yet. So who has actually been using templates or who has, who, who says, no, nah, not really, don't really want to go into it? Okay, so lots of template users. <laughs> um, is there anything that you'd like to share from your use, from your experience with your instructors? Does it differ from um, what I've been telling or is it very similar? Alison. Are you saying once the template's set up, are you seeing much diversity? Like or you're seeing that stamp kind of. Once it's introduced to the student, do the students say, yep, this is gospel, therefore I will keep it? Yeah. Or do you see that they use it as a starting, as a launch for, for an invitation to grow and understand? It really depends. It depends on how frequently students use Mahara and are comfortable with the tool and also comfortable with technology in general, um, whether they make more or less use of changing things around. Um, I've seen it that templates were used just strict to, I just put my text box in here and that's all I'm doing, versus changing everything around and also changing the layout, going away from a three column layout to a two column layout, removing the instructions, because once you know what you do, then you don't really need to have those in there anymore. And so it, it really depends. Um, but so far what I've seen is it really also depends on the tech saviness and how comfortable people are in general working with the computer, working online and using different platforms and how far they want to go. Because we still have people who just see it as, yes, it's a requirement, I just do the bare minimum. And sometimes they can only do the bare minimum because they have so many other um, responsibilities uh, versus those that want to take it a step further, that want to explore how can I actually do more with it. But I think it's better for me to give that question back to you who have been working with templates already at your organizations, um, what you have also seen there. I would like to share some of our um, lectures experience with using templates. So there are lectures, they actually um, totally agree with Christina that the template is not something that you instruct student. This is what you do, this is what you, what you can do. Um, that particular lecture that I was thinking to say is he actually introduced, he actually um, product, provided the students three like a different templates. So it's more of giving students ideas of what what they can do on the page rather than um, what you are required. This is the place that you put things in. So that's one end. But on the other hand, there are lectures um, giving students, trying to give students everything on a template. Um, and uh, I'm not saying that um, the journal we did um, that lecture actually did try to use journal entries to set everything up so mm -hmm. students all what they need required to do is putting the journal entries but um, in Mahara when you copy the template the journal entries doesn't get copied over Depends on the settings. Um, it is possible by, by changing the block settings so that the journal is actually copied into the new account then. Yeah, but that's that's the second step that has to be taken. Um, only for only for the journal, because um, that is oftentimes where the reflections are, and so that's oftentimes the least thing 
that should be copied from an existing portfolio. So at the time, I guess, when the functionality was implemented, people weren't really thinking so much about working with templates and making a journal, av a journal template available to others, but rather about journals are individual things, so we are not giving those away to others. Um, and, and most of the time, um, my experience with lecturers is that the template is often sort of like a set of training wheels for them. Like they feel more confident because they've got a standard thing that they know that's matched to the requirements for the assessment item, and then they can sort of say, "Here, do this." Yeah. Um, but the student, but I always say to them, give the students the option: use the template or build your own page. It's up to you. And that way, the confident students do something else. They should be mm. saying and just sort of go for broke. But often it's to do with the confidence level of the lecturer, I think. They feel a lot more confident in being able to cope with this whole e-portfolio thingy. Yeah. If they've got a standard kind of thingy that they can just say, do this, and they know how it works. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> just to extend on to what Shen was saying, um, the, a, lot of, a lot of times when lecturers and their students use Mahara for the first time, they don't know how it works, don't know what it's capable of. So creating templates um, or just examples of portfolios like for them to have a look at and using various different layout techniques and um, text files and image placements, etc, etc, is very helpful to them because then they can go, oh, I can do it this way, I can lay it out that way, I can change it so that it's three columns in a row and this and that. Um, I found that it's actually quite useful for people to actually start thinking of like, this is not just a document convention. And that also goes back to what Sam said earlier about um, giving exemplars, having an example there so that pe uh, students know what can it look like. And especially if it's a template that can be that the students can then also share publicly or at least within the university context, then maybe even having it available beyond that so that you get a collection of templates and a collection of exemplars that you can show future students so that they really see the diversity and the things that they can do so that not every page has to look like the other. It is not really an, as a paper that you submit to a course where you need to follow very strict rules and where everybody needs to have the same margin and the same font size and the same spacing and things like that. But I find an e-portfolio, especially because we can work with multimedia, should be a bit more personal, more expressive and also showing who you are in there. But of course, always still sticking to all the requirements, especially if you also have to submit it for coursework. Anybody else wants to share their template story? Oh, well, I guess from a new set perspective, um, each of the pages for us is a competency, and a competency set by a regulatory body. So we're already used to supplying particular evidence for a competency anyway. Um, and so free, having free text is really useful, but also they can upload additional evidence. So it has the flexibility to provide other types of evidence as well as just the free text. So it's sort of worked quite well already. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much for your insight. And now I think it is time for lunch out there.